Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now back in 2019 we tested the AMD Athlon 3000G, a $49 socket AM4 APU with onboard Vega 3 graphics. This cheap chip was a favourite on the channel and I kept it for a few years, often trying to play new games with varied levels of success and massive levels of graphical sacrifice. At one point I even overclocked the integrated graphics from 1100 to 1650 MHz, which made a no noticeable performance improvement in a lot of titles. Six years later, and look what I have here, it's the 3000G, a re-release, or maybe even a re-re-release. That's right, the budget entry level offering is back, and as much as I'd like to say, better than ever, I simply can't. So what has changed? Well, we get a new box, for starters. It looks pretty snazzy, if you ask me. Inside the box we get a Wraith Stealth Cooler, a welcome upgrade from the little square cooler that we originally got bundled with this. That was fine and temperatures were never an issue with the 35 Watt 3000G, but this will keep temperatures even lower and it should be quieter too. This is the chip itself. Notice the date says 2016 and the product code ends in FH. From what I've researched there are variants that end in FH but it's the FH or DALI revision that has started to reappear. Unlike the FB version, this one officially supports Windows 11 and features two physical cores instead of being a quad-core die with two cores disabled. In other words, nothing has really changed. This has always been a dual-core chip in one way or another. We get two cores, four threads, a 3.5 GHz base clock speed, four MB of L3 cache and Vega 3 graphics. Both the CPU and GPU are overclockable, though it's the iGPU that benefits most from an increase in speed. I managed to get the Vega graphics from 1100 to 1650, just like I did six years ago, simply by typing in this desired speed under the GFX overclock section in the BIOS. I didn't change the voltage. The original cooler handled this just fine, so the new one will have no issues either. Oh, and did I mention I did this with an ASUS X570F gaming motherboard that doesn't even officially support the 3000G, according to the website. So it's been a while, but let's see what it's like to play games with one of these in 2025. I have it paired with 32 gigs of 3200MHz DDR4, and I'm using Windows 11. This chip cost me £38 brand new on Amazon, but if you want one, you may as well buy a second hand chip for much less. It's like 18 quid at CEX. But then again, so is a 6 core Ryzen 5 1600 or i5 8400T at the time of upload. But it's clear that this thing must still be in demand. It's fine for everyday usage, if not a little sluggish, if you get a bit overzealous with Google Chrome tabs, but it's not horrendous, put it that way. Now of course we're all about gaming on this channel, and the main reason I bought one half a decade ago is the same reason I bought one today, to test out the onboard graphics, albeit somewhat overclocked. So I've tested a handful of games today, but we will have a more extensive benchmark video with the 3000G very soon, perhaps trying to run some of the latest and greatest titles and some more demanding games on it as well. But with that said, it really can't handle that much. The Vega 3 graphics, even when overclocked, aren't all that great as you may imagine. They were never brilliant back in the day, and in 2025 they're going to struggle even more. Counter-Strike 2 to start with then, I'm using 720p with the lowest in-game settings. Now I did choose low to start with, and this actually turned FSR on, but it made performance worse. In fact, whether we were using 1080p, 900p or 720p, it didn't really make a difference. We were still getting 44 frames per second or thereabouts. It was between 40 and 50 regardless. We'll move on to Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. This is not the type of game you should be playing on a 3000G, but surprisingly, it was playable at 30 frames per second. It certainly hurt my eyeballs after about 10 minutes, but it's 720p with the lowest settings and FSR 3.1 set to performance mode, so as low as we can go really. We were seeing 33 FPS, a 1% low of 20 2 and a 0.1% low of 18. Not bad for two cores, four threads, and integrated graphics. Eh? Two cores in this one seems to be okay. I've tested it with the Pentium G7400 as well, but we do need uh, SMT or hyper threading. So those four threads are important. It's not ideal, of course, but it's doable. 
which is more than I anticipated. Fallout 4 up next, thought I'd reinstall this one at 720p with the low preset and TAA. The reason I did this is because I remember it running just fine on the 3000G back then. Uh, well, at 720p anyway, and around about 30 FPS or 1080p, but 720p is going to almost double that, well, 52 frames per second. The percentile lows are also going to be a bit smoother. 33 was that 1% low, and the 0.1% low was 23. So I don't think it's too bad, really. Definitely felt playable and didn't look too horrible at 720p. Cyberpunk 2077 is up next, and just like Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, we hit 30 frames per second just about. Oh no, sorry, we didn't. Not in this one. At 720p with FSR 3 performance, we got 29 frames per second. We can choose between FSR 3 and FSR 2.1. Neither option is going to make a difference. There may be one or two frames in it, but there still uh, is going to be drops below. 30 frames per second quite frequently as represented by the percentile lows of 17 and 13. Finally we have GTA 5 Legacy. Now this is more the sort of game you want to be playing on a Vega 3 iGPU and Athlon CPU. 1080p this time around I was feeling a bit daring but we certainly could have done with 900 or 720p. I chose normal or this game's lowest settings. I did keep the sliders halfway though, it actually defaulted to this, and FXAA was also enabled for 37 frames per second, a 1% low of 24, and a 0.1% low of 21. This reminds me of the original PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 experience in terms of frame rate, which is actually a bit better here to be honest, uh, and certainly visuals. Takes me back to 2013 when I first purchased this on my PlayStation 3, and what a great time I had. Now we aren't limited to integrated graphics of course, we can also pair the 3000G with a discrete GPU. An old 1060 or 580 is probably as high as I'd go. Actually it's probably higher than I'd go because the 3000G will even hold back my 4 gig 570. Come to think of it, the CPU even held back the integrated GPU in some occasions. I think Cyberpunk was one such example. The CPU itself is just too weak really to be paired with any modern graphics card, so don't go sticking a 5080 along with this beast. Although, oh yeah, I need to do a bottleneck video, maybe a 3000G with like a 5070. I think that's the best card I currently own. I have one of those somewhere, so maybe I'll stick those two together. What a glorious disaster that will be. Uh, for now though, let's focus on the 570. I just tested one game for now because it's clear that uh, the CPU is a bottleneck massively, even in this one instance. I can't wait to throw a 50 series card in a system with a 3000G inside it. So despite its flaws, I am glad to have one of these back in my life. We will be benchmarking a full suite of games very soon, focusing more on the integrated graphics. But as soon as this arrived, I wanted to test it out and talk about what has changed. Not much, to be honest. A new box and a better cooler. Still, I guess you could say this is the king of the sub $50 or £40 market right now, but it's not an exciting victory. It's like winning a race because no one else bothered to turn up. In this case, a very slow race. Now, I know this isn't intended for gamers uh, because the Radeon graphics logo has even been removed from the box entirely. I think it's been relegated to a little bit of text on the label, but we'll see how it handles itself in some more titles very soon. And we'll also pair it with a high end GPU as well. As for this one, let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you as always for watching and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.